Crouch. Find. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Hello and welcome to House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe. Some may say it's a miracle that we've made it to Episode 3, particularly if you've seen uh, behind the scenes the technicalities they have been testing. But English people will be over the moon to know that it is no longer a Celtic lockdown. Uh, I'm delighted to have this week um, Alex Good back after his starring role in Episode 1. And Autumn Nations Cup, one of the top try scorers, Jamie George, an Autumn Nations Cup winner. Uh, guys, great to have you here. Um, it was a bit of a slog, wasn't it, getting on? But um, Alex, what is the time check in Japan at the moment? Uh, yeah, it's about 5am, so pretty early. And uh, apologies for my delay in terms of uh, whatever I've been downloading, which is slowing up my internet, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's loved line. it. Jamie has Stole loved my it. my line. <laughs> um, when was the last time you two saw each other? Well, I was about uh, to say you look a lot better than the last time I saw you at five a.m. Yeah, well, yeah, it's probably um, part of the course, really. At any stage, <laughs> anyone sees me after one o'clock, um, slobbering get my words out. Yeah, <laughs> they're very coherent at five a.m. constantly. Uh, yeah, no, it'd probably be um, last time we saw each other as a whole group, really. Um, after our last game against uh, Bath. Good night, that, actually. We had, yeah, Couple we had a bit of, of a, a send-off for everyone um, in our in our bubble, effectively, at the time. And, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't the perfect way to say goodbye to a lot of players like um, Brad and Wiggy, etc. But um, it was nice just to be be there as a team, really. And, uh, and then these boys went off and went into their own bubble and uh, have uh, torn up trees and um, got all the success they deserve. And got an impressive hangover as well, Jamie, to keep the theme yeah, going. Yeah, was, I, was, I was in trouble yesterday. Um, we had, obviously, we finished the game and then had a few beers in the change room and stuff. And then it was like straight back to the Lensbury last day. Uh, it was technically my stag do because I'm getting married this weekend. So, yeah, I said to you before, it's like it's the worst destination for a stag do ever. <laughs> the Lensbury Hotel uh in one of the conference rooms but um we made the where most were you of it. meant to be going where were you where were you oh, well, to I hadn't, this is the thing i hadn't really planned it um elliot daly was my best man so i mean he literally genuinely like piss up in a brewery he couldn't he couldn't organize that at all so uh i went to owen farrell stag in havar which okay, I, yeah. I would love to repeat a great spot but not the lensbury the Lensbury is is definitely bottom three, but like I said, we made we made it work. It's not how you um, imagine it, is it? It being a conference room, you know, with a pen and paper everywhere, you know, maybe some mints, um, but yeah, some <laughs> some beers as well, I guess. So and and you got the the river, so you know, have a splash. Weird, yeah. Like, well, that's, that's like a big big thing to have on your stag do the view of a river well i don't know someone might have just taken it too far really like this is this epitomizes what we're trying to say i mean it we're scraping the barrel to find positives for the lensbury as a stag destination yeah firmly so firmly. can because if you invite people to your stag do in havar or something like that you can choose or elliot whoever can can select the people you want to go i presume at the lensbury everyone who was part of that squad therefore was there <laughs> Eddie. Yeah, sa- was he there? Eddie, yeah, Eddie, Eddie was on my stag. Good crack, actually. Good. He had a he had a fair few glass of red. Um, yeah, like Sam Underhill was was quite funny. He was like, I never ever expected we get on really well, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm I love taking the piss out of him. And he was like, I never expected to be on your stag. Do it's a massive honour. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I was like, yeah. I mean, just for clarity, <laughs> if if you if you didn't have to be here, then you wouldn't be. Oh, that's <laughs> Wow, ruthless. Wow, well, we're getting joking. to know Jamie George joking. a bit better now. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel about your teammates. Let's go. Through, through I'm the only joking. I love, I love Adil. I'm only joking. In terms of uh, piss-ups, just going back to that, because obviously your wedding is not <laughs> going to be that. It's going to be a very respectable situation. Um, yeah. Saracen's piss-ups are legendary. Alex Good, your Saracen's piss-ups have been like a thing of uh, like news-making stories. Yeah, look, I think as uh, as a team, we like any team, we enjoy uh, each other's company after, with a few beers. Um, I think some of our trips together, uh, I, I sort of genuinely believe they've helped us on the field, um, spending time with each other, you know, uh, get to know each other a bit better. 
and alcohol does help that in, in my opinion <laughs> Um, I'm not sure the science on that, but I'm not sure if that um, was done up in a court of law. To be honest, no, no, but <laughs> no. I, I mean, I, look, I, I like any any teammates love going away with the boys to a good place. You know, having some good meals, having some drinks together, and just having a lot of fun. It does bring us close together, I think. And uh, um, you know, some of the trips um, to the odd ski resort have been uh, perhaps dangerous at times, but. Um, no injuries and everyone's had a great time really. Uh, did you not post, was it George Cruz or, or yours, Jamie, but did you not post at someone's address on Twitter or something? <laughs> yeah, that that was, it wasn't mine, thankfully, but Goody, <laughs> was it you that tweeted? <laughs> no, it was Duncan, Duncan yeah. Taylor originally, I think. And I then think you, recently, the first time, yeah. The first one was like on a random Sunday, just saying after party at George Cruz's house and then posted his actual, his actual address, which was really really quite good crack um and george said the best thing about it was that he didn't have anyone turn up but one bloke with a six pack of carlsberg it was just and like he was like do you really expect me to let you into my house like get out yeah. it was great i mean i think the, the best bit about it was george used to get so angry about it so yeah. um when i did it on the uh what, was it, what two years ago now? i can 15, see why to ago. be fair no, I can, but it's George. So as, as we've established, he's, you know, up and down. So sometimes he deserves it. Um, but, uh, yeah, on the uh, the Monday, I think, uh, after the European Cup final, I, I put his address out there with the boys sort of egging me on a bit and uh, we thought it was hilarious. Um, and actually when we'd left the house, uh, again, the same thing, these, these two guys turned up with a, a crate of beer at sort of five o'clock and George's housemate <laughs> opened the door and said, uh, what are you doing? And they were like, oh, we're here for the uh, the party, you know, with Alex and his full <laughs> kit. <laughs> it was like, they've already left, mate, sorry. <laughs> These guys are driv- driven, like, I don't know, half an hour or so, an hour to, after work to come and join us. Um, so they were pretty devastated. Um, but George did say to me, he said, um, this is before the World Cup, and he said, look, if I get burgled, I'm coming for an insurance claim on you for, te- for telling them where I live. <laughs> I was sort of living in fear throughout the World Cup, thinking, is he serious? Because he might actually take me to court on this one. But um, luckily no one went there, so it's okay. Uh, we have got a pretty busy programme coming up for you. We're going to talk an awful lot more about Saracens. Uh, we're going to talk about world rugby's players and teams of the decade. I'm sure you saw that. And also we're going to talk about the sad story of uh, Steve Thompson's battle with dementia and the lawsuits. But first, let's talk Autumn Nations Cup. Okay, let's first of all talk about Sunday's match. Uh, Jamie, congratulations. You've won the Autumn Nations Cup. I mean, that's what you set out to do. But France made it pretty difficult for most of it. Or did England make it pretty difficult for themselves for most of it? Uh, Yeah, it was... um... It's a tense one, wasn't it? Um, no, it was, I always knew that that game was going to be that way. Like before the game, there was a lot of talk about the French team that had been picked and um, how, you know, it was the Mickey Mouse Cup and all that stuff. And I just thought, oh, there's no way that this French team is going to be allow this to happen. Like the way the set of coaches that they've got there now, yeah. they've obviously got huge backing with the World Cup being there in four years' time. And, the depth of players, like I spoke to Alex Lazowski not long ago, and he was saying, like, you just you just see so many, like, first of all, massive blokes in that league. So they turned up with the biggest team ever. And then, you know, such good players. And, you know, it was never going to be a walkover. Um, look, we didn't we didn't play overly well, but at the same time, I think a year ago, we probably wouldn't have we we would have lost that game. So uh it was good for us to find a way to win. And um, yeah, we're probably the first and last winners of the Autumn Nations Cup. I don't think it's probably never going to happen again, is it? (laughs) Why do you think a year ago you would have um, lost that? I know that Eddie's spoken about, you know, he was worried about the World Cup final hangover. And since then, you've won this Autumn Nations Cup. You've um, won Six Nations as well. But what makes you say that? I just think that there were times probably in games previously in 2019, you look at the final as well, um, where... You know, things started to get a little bit tough and, um, you know, when we certainly when we needed to chase games, we let games get away from us a little bit. Um, and I think that stemmed down from individual responsibility of players getting carried away, but also the leadership of the team. And I think the way that the team's been led over the last 12 months since that final has been amazing. 
Um, and, you know, we were a lot calmer on the field. You know, we, it's great, you know, experiences everything in this game. And, you know, we, we certainly drew on the experience of the final. And, um, you know, we, we didn't try and fix things on our own. We stuck to the system and, you know, eventually it worked for us. We had to do it in the 79th minute and then the, the whatever it was, the 18th minute of extra time. But, you know, that I think, again, having gone through that experience, the team's only going to be better from it. Do you talk a lot about um, that a lot of World Cup winning teams or finalists sort of have a slump after the World Cup and sometimes struggle? Would there be a mention about how you wanted to just keep the momentum after the World Cup and, and everything you'd done? through the year yeah I think there was there was an element of that like we didn't we didn't really talk about the negative side of things but what we do do well as a team like we we run um sort of communication sessions within the team where the coaches aren't in there um and I think that's one thing that, that we that we do really well is sort of get everything out in the open we try and make it the most honest and open group that we possibly can do where you know if you do have concerns if you do think that we're still struggling from the world cup if you do if you are nervous for the game at the weekend you know we give people opportunity to speak about it um and i just think that we're in a such better place off the back of it you know before sometimes those things can seem quite scripted and you know to be honest a bit of a waste of time but these we've managed to find a way where it's all very player run and you know we've managed to like you said keep going with the sort of momentum from the World Cup and then, you know, thankful to to win that Six Nations and then took it into the Autumn Nations Cup as well. Is that a new thing, Jamie, to, to have a, a communications meeting without coaches? No, it came in before the World Cup. So we had a couple of psychologists come in and, and do it. Um, Will Carling comes in for it also. Um, just he does a a bit of consultancy work for us. I guess you could call it that. I don't know. He's, he's a great bloke, Will Carling. But he, um, yeah, he comes in and does sort of helps all the leaders out. You know, obviously one of the best England captains of all time. So he runs it. But generally, you know, the psychologist and the and Will will be in there. Um, but more often than not, it's sort of the leadership group or, you know, they'll give it to us a couple of different players to, to run. And, you know, like I said, there's not, there's never that much structure to it but it's more of a you know what we're thinking this week how do we think last week went um and then you know there might be a couple of exercises the psychologist tries to do with us just to to get us talking as a group if it's if it's going a bit quiet did you ever think uh, or was it discussed jamie that um if things weren't done and dusted in that extra time that you got to those kicks you know who who would be taking the kicks <laughs> We well, I don't know about anyone else. I imagine Owen and George and people like that yeah. probably knew, but I didn't even realise that there was going to be an extra time. Like, I, I, we were all running around on the sideline, and then myself and Ellis Genge were talking, and then we heard that it was golden point, and we weren't sure whether the lads on the field knew. They obviously did know, um, <laughs> but but we were like panicking. You, you certainly we were hope like, so. Well, no, they did. It turned out they did. But we were panicking and like sh trying to shout from the stand, like it's golden point, lads. Like take a drop goal. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, we just everyone at that at that stage. You know, you much rather be on the field. Like I was so so nervous in the stand. I'm a terrible watcher at the best of times, and yeah, I uh, I'm very glad. Although it would have been quite intriguing. I'd quite like to have watched the the penalty kicks. To be honest. It was interesting. We've all been sitting, um, waiting for fans to come back, desperate for fans to come back to sport. Um, I know a lot of the players were saying about it. they could hear them cheering and it was great to get that atmosphere. Maybe the booing less so. I mean, that must have been a surprise. Could you hear it, Jamie? I couldn't, no. Um, but it was, I mean, look, first and foremost, it was it was amazing to get the to get fans back in the stands. Like, yeah. it's been so weird, you know, for me personally, I had my 50th cap and Ben Young's had his 100th cap and we're running yeah. out to an empty stadium, just sort of giving it the big in. Um, and actually running out of Twickenham, even though it was 2000, I thought those 2000 gave it a good crack to create a good atmosphere. And um, No, it was, it was great to have them back in there. I didn't I didn't hear any of the booing, but um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was probably a bit too tense for me to hear any of that. So, Jamie, obviously when you got the hat trick... Um... You know, pretty impressive. Must say I was pretty happy at home watching. Um, very late in the evening for me, though. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was just wondering, do you get the ball afterwards? Did you go up to the ref and just say, I'll have the ball off you? You know, do you know, Jack Grealish um, or 
Did you get anything for it? Well, just for clarity, it wasn't overly impressive, was it? Like it, <laughs> like I literally didn't. Jamie, have it's a hat trick for your country, yeah, mate. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'm taking it. it. I'm yeah. taking it. There's not many who have scored wasn't. a hat trick for England. True. I'm going to take it. Don't get me wrong, but um, no, I didn't even think about the match ball, and I'd wish I had done. I mean, yeah, fun, it's funny. I don't really score that many, so um, yeah, I didn't think. Of, I am gutted I didn't get the match ball, but um, that would have been quite a good crack. Yeah. Did actually on any of the tries? Did you manage to get your feet over the try line? No, because I always count as a half a try. I think if you get hey, your feet just, over the try line, it should count as a full try, and then half if you if you just sort of flop. You flop yeah. over, yeah. I am good at, yeah. It's just, it is quite embarrassing. You know what it's like. Like if if you'd score, if I scored like two, and then maybe one other from at least five meters out, where I didn't have eight lads in front of me, then that might have been slightly more impressive. But yeah, you, know, you can't go around giving it the big in about a hat trick from all tries. Well, I don't know, mate. I take I take three tries for England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Again, I'm, I'm definitely taking it. Yeah, maybe have a word with the ref about getting the ball now. Maybe too late, but you can always get there. I mean, <laughs> it makes you feel post. better. Yeah, I didn't ask for the ball after my first game in Japan. Um, I didn't dare speak to the ref after uh, one instance where um, there was a penalty to the opposition team. And uh, so their penalty, kicking to touch. They kick to touch. Um, ball goes out by about five, six yards, like a good distance. Linesman puts his flag up, you know. Uh, my, my teammate goes from out of the field, takes the ball, runs two yards onto the field, then throws it to the fullback. I'm sort of wondering what they're doing here, lads. It's a bit mad. Fullback starts running off and the referee just sort of plays on. And I'm like, hang on, on what level is this okay? One, the ball has gone out and my teammates just run it back on. And secondly, it was <laughs> their penalty. And next thing you know, we're, we're five yards in their line. I'm trying to catch up going, what have I just seen? Um, but, uh, you know, it's just adapting to the uh, the referee's interpretation, I guess, not just the rules of the game. What What's the equivalent of Jue in Japan, Good. Um, Jue, is it? uh, it's really a, a Jue. I think it's just just constantly Jue. It's just uh, <laughs> wide is wide is good. Just go wide. Just go wide again. Make a break, go wide. <laughs> <laughs> if in doubt, go wide. Um, so, yes, yeah, a lot of uh, I can't, around, I can't uh, wait. I can't wait for you to come back to Saris and we just play direct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're gonna get so uh, gonna frustrated, miss... mate. Yeah, I don't think that's quite gonna happen. I think I'll be alright about it. <laughs> it's frustrations everywhere in the world, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Leave it at that. Was it was was the standard decent or like like be honest like, I, with me here, like what was the No, like Don't give me I, the I media was... answer, give me the, the No, I, I I was pleasantly surprised. I, I look I came into it not sure. Um you know, I had heard good things, bad things. The, the players, like, they are in, they are unbelievable athletes. Like, you've got these guys who, like, not no fat on them. They work so hard. They're ripped up. They're so strong in the gym. Yeah, these guys are, like, one guy's, like, 85 kilos just banging out 150 on the bench. All of them are, like, 140 plus. I'm going, yeah, how the hell are you doing that, guys? You, know, you must look tiny. so pathetic in that team. Well... <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't know pathetic because I'm quite tall. So I put it quite gangly. So they're all saying like, oh, yeah, you, you're pretty fit. They expect you to be really physical, you know, probably take the gain line, be swatting people off and then they see me play and realise that I'm just avoiding contact at all costs. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, they, they like, it's impressive, their training. Like, minute one, they are 100 miles an hour in the morning. This, like, 35-year-old, he's just doing sprints everywhere in the morning, afternoon, sprinting everywhere, you know, banging up. You know, 10, 11 Ks Monday, 10, 11 Ks Tuesday. I'm like, guys, I, I haven't got this in me. My hamstring's going to come off the bone at this point. But <laughs> um, they, they, the work ethic and the like, the excitement they get from playing rugby is really infectious. They just want to run and play and basically play Jouet the whole time, which is, uh, which is fun to be part of, I've got to say. Well, Alex, the reason that you are playing out in Japan just now and not at Saracens is because of everything that's gone on over the last 12 months. And we actually talked about it at the beginning when you were talking about your night out, that sort of uh, collective of players has either dispersed for one year and they'll all be coming back or Jamie, like you, uh, a lot of them have stayed. Um, you're obviously not playing Leicester this weekend because you're getting married. Uh, but I just wonder, Jamie, what does the next sort of six months look like for you as a Saracens player? How much are you actually going to play for the club? Um, well, those conversations are still ongoing, really. Um, initially, the talk was not, not a huge amount. 
Um, and it's gen- generally the club have been brilliant. So, you know, they've said it's personal preference whether we want to use the championship games as a bit of fitness prior to hopefully getting selected for England. So um, that was initially the plan. Obviously, with everything getting delayed now, um, you know, we might have a few a few fines or bans from the Barbarians game. So we might be needed to play the first couple. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the next six months, you know, I'll come in probably after Christmas now. Um, there's a bit of talk around the championship starting mid-January, um, which is a, two weeks, I think, before before this, we meet up with the Six Nations. So uh could be a good opportunity for us to get back into it. Um, so might might play a couple of games there and then hopefully guess late selected for the Six Nations so away then for the next couple of months and you know I guess it's then about seeing what sort of position we are at and and how we're getting on in the league and um how we're feeling physically and mentally and then sort of see how we go from there but one of the best things about Saris is is that you are always really managed very well so you know they they genuinely ask your opinion and it seems as if it's it's going to be a personal preference. So um, I know that Billy, for example, is is just mad mad to play. He's desperate for, you know, he's a new, he's a he's a new dad. So I'm pretty sure he's keen for a couple of away trips so that he can get some sleep <laughs> and maybe some beers. I don't know. Um, it's interesting because it's not just uh, Six Nations and England. You've got Alliance as well next year. So I imagine that you want to put yourself in the shop window for all of these big occasions when you were deciding to stay at Saracens or when that collective was, which has really been the framework for England over the last couple of years. Did you speak to Eddie? Did you speak to Warren Gatland about where these opportunities to showcase your talents um, would come from if you weren't playing week in, week out in the Prem? Yeah, I I spoke to Eddie. Eddie was one of the first people I spoke to really because, you know, my main ambition, like you said, is to to put my hand up for that Lions tour, um, especially off the back of having been involved in the last one. You know, once you do one, you're desperate to do another one, really. So that was definitely the case. Eddie, Eddie was great. He just said, you know, as long as as long as you keep yourself in, in reasonable nick, then, you know, we'll keep selecting you or, you know, have more opportunity. For, he thought it was a good thing for us to probably have a bit of a rest um, and do a bit more S&C stuff off the field, which which I think will be good for us. Um Mark McCall at the club had spoken to to Gats, um, who seemed to again take a pretty similar standpoint and say, you know, like as long as you're putting your hand up for selection for England and playing in those games, then you know those are the ones that he's going to be looking at. So um, hopefully, all that goes to plan. Um, and yeah, I'm you know I'm I'm actually quite excited about for what, what the next six months looks like. Alex, what's the difference though between a rugby player? training and a rugby player playing and being battle-hardened before they go into a test match? I think the uh, difference between um, playing and not playing, uh, so I think if you're a young guy and you haven't got much experience, then training um, isn't perfect for you. You want to play games, you need to get experience, you need to get all the understanding of, of match scenarios. I think for, for these guys we're referring to, you know, they've played a lot of games of rugby and actually a break is really, really good for them. Um, you know, generally um, they, they've gone now from 2017 uh, Lions all the way through and they've had a whole year of club rugby and I think it's towards South Africa. And the next year it's the World Cup year. So they've played so much rugby and the best thing probably for them is to have a rest, look after themselves, just make sure they're fit. Because when they turn up for the international games, you know, they'll they'll play for England, you know, ideally they'll be fit, they'll be fresh and we'll probably see some of their best performances. Um, and so that's why I guess Eddie and, and Gatlin are so you know, okay about it or happy about it because they know these players should be ideally touch wood, fresh and fit and injury free, which is very rare going into a, a Lions tour. Everyone's got a niggle or yeah. got some kind of injury where they have to have an operation after it. So I, I think it would be good for these guys. You know, obviously I'm speaking on their behalf, but um, they, they're good enough players that they'll be fine going into the international games. And Alex, from your point of view, um, how much uh, contact do you have with Mark McCall or with the club since you've been in Japan? Because you're still part of Saracens. Yeah, I'm just hanging on my fingernails on the outside. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, to be fair, Mark uh, gave me a call um, a couple of weeks ago, which, which was great just to check in. I uh, had a few texts back and forth with uh, some of the coaches, uh, which has been great. They're all sort of, 
seeing what Japan's like. I think they're angling for a move at some stage in the future. Um, <laughs> but uh, I won't name the coaches. Um, but, um, yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, they've been really good, to be fair. And then, obviously, the boys, I'm sort of, uh, sort of hanging in the background the WhatsApp group and there's a couple other groups that I'm part of. I'm on a Call of Duty group, actually, which I don't even play Call of Duty. So, um, yeah, anything, anything just to sort of catch up with the boys and, and hear what they've been up to in the day, which is usually just anyone fancy a game. But sometimes there's a bit of gold in there, you hear. So, yeah, hearing about Jamie's Call of Duty skills, which are improving by the day I hear. So it's good to know. I'm so bad. We, we play, like, I, only, I don't play at home and just because, you know, bubble life you've got to try and entertain yourself but oh i am awful there are some guys that are pretty mega as well like luke and dicky was like number one in the world wow. at one stage yeah. and he had all those boys and he's come like <laughs> we had a red bull gave us like a gaming center so they had like big screens all over the place and playstations and xboxes and i see <laughs> the lads could watch you play and honestly it was it was embarrassing <laughs> like luke was like mate you are horrendous and i was like yeah it's not it's not my natural game that i don't think yeah it's the yeah, taking part seems... of the counts right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i'm just i'm literally just there just for like the socials like whack the headset in like boys are trying to take it seriously and there's me like what'd you get up to today lads anything good like we're like they're getting so annoyed let's just take the clock back uh 12 months so when the news broke about saracens i was on the train from london to cardiff i was going to present the champions cup launch so you imagine when i got there there was like absolute disarray there was an empty seat for mark mccall there was an empty seat in the stage for if anybody turned up obviously nobody turned up um how much warning did you both have that this was going to happen in the way it did uh jamie we'll start with you uh, we didn't have an awful lot because we were we were still at the World Cup whilst the sort of talk was going on. Like we, I, th I can't remember when we first heard the rumours. I think probably with the same as everyone else that we were being investigated. But you know, we never thought that anything would come of it. Um, and then, yeah, basically two days after the World Cup final, Mark McCall phoned me and just said, "Look, this is this is happening." Um, so it, it went from bad to worse, really. To be honest, so it wasn't a great, wasn't a great week that one. But um, yeah, I think that was the, that was the first that I heard of it. But it was all still relatively up in the air what the outcome was actually going to be. So, um, what about you, Gude? When did you hit? Um, I don't think we really heard any any earlier than you guys. Um, yeah, it was it was just a lot of rumours floating around, um, but it it wasn't anything that drastic. It was all quite calm, and then I think we. Uh, played the first game or something like that and bang, it just hit us. And I think we got it the morning before. Um, but I think that that first sort of fine um, 35 points deduction, we were all like in shock, but it also gave us something to aim for. <clears throat> we were like, well, okay, this is a nightmare. It's destroyed Europe this year it's destroyed us doing anything um and there was obviously a lot of feelings but as a group we're like right well we've just got to keep the club in the premiership okay that's our only aim that's what we're going towards this is our goal this is this is everything now um and it was a bit of a rally it was like okay we've got to come together and fight really hard the England boys are coming back from the world cup we've got to pick up the slack the guys here and, and do as well as possible and then they come back and give us a boost um but yeah, it was just, it was no time for preparation of it or to think about it. It just hit us. And I think even Mark McCall only found out maybe the, a couple of hours before us, et cetera. Because in this day and age, the media pick up on everything so quick. You can't hide things and, and gradually tell the squad. It's just, you got to tell them straight away because in an hour's time, there'll be a press release. So um, in that regard, it was, it was really out of the blue for us and they never expected that. We know the, the wrongs of it. The whole thing has been discussed so much um, in the media between different people, between different players. How much was it discussed within your group? Because I imagine the psychological strains or just really the emotions must have been pretty tough for you all. Yeah, I mean, we spoke about it a lot. Like, you know, it's hard not to speak about it. You can't not speak about it whilst it's happening. Um, I think at first... The emotion of it, the the fact that it was us against the world, we quite like, we quite enjoyed that element of it. Um, you know, I remember watching. Was it was it Gloucester away? Was that the first game that we had? Good, I think. Yeah. Um, and that was like, I remember watching it at home and thinking, like, wow, like 
what a performance this epitomizes what Saracen's about. And we, we certainly played on it for a little while in terms of, you know, wanting to prove a point. Um, and, you know, using it to almost bring the group closer together. I think the more that time went on, the the worse the sort of um, the di- all the, um, whatever you call it, the disciplinary actions happened, the worse mm-hmm. that the bands got, the, the harder it was to sort of use that side of things, the psychology of it. But then, I don't know, we guess we were, we were sort of in a position to then maybe have more conversations about what things are going to look like. I think there was probably a, a month or so where everything was very much up in the air. You know, Goody will have been trying to work out what he was doing. I was trying to work out what I was doing. You know, was there, were we going to be playing in the championship? If so, you know, those, that was the time when, you know, we were having the conversations with Eddie and all the rest of it. So, you know, I think that was probably the toughest month for me. But then, you know, again, things started looking up again and we had Europe to go after at that point. And, you know, once everyone had got their sort of houses in order and we realised that, you know, it was it was going to be the last year for a couple of legends at the club and Wiggy mm-hmm. and Brad and lots of other people leaving, like George and Goody going away for a year. And it was actually like, right, we need to play for each other here and we need to, you know, make the most of this time that we have together because it's not always, it's not ever going to be the same. Yeah, I think that bit at the end of Jan when it sort of hit us and and we had no idea of that, that we were going to be relegated and that was finalised. That that was really, really tough period. Um, You know, you were my emotions were sort of angry, but then also sadness, what's going to happen, the uncertainty. And both me and Jamie had only been at one club. So relatively easy. We want to stay there. Uh, You know, I speak for myself. I wanted to stay there and finish out my career and next thing you know you're not sure what's going to happen um you're not sure if you you know if you can if you can stay if you have to go are we going to be back in the premiership and and it was just all up in the air and I think our performances in that period probably summed it up one week it was a big emotional spike next week we'd lose by 50 points or 40 points and just wasn't like us but everyone's heads were everywhere you know it was there's a lot of boys talking about what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you thinking, what's happening, um, and no one knew. So it was a really uncertain period and quite a tough period in that sense. I mean, very tough. And um, and then you think, well, we've got Europe to play for now. We're going to just put everything into that. And then COVID hits, and you're like, and then the uncertainty again, and people then leave before you even get to give them a send off. And it, it became very difficult and a very tough period. Did it affect friendships that you had with other players? Because there were players, whether it be at Harlequins or Exeter, who were pretty outspoken about everything. Um, Jamie, you're obviously in that England setup, and some people might have been saying different things. Did it actually affect friendships? I don't know. I don't know whether it ever affected friendships because, you know, look, it, it's never nice when you hear um, people talking like that, especially people that you respect and that you that you care about. Um, but at the same time, I think they're, they're very entitled to their opinion. It was never news to me that that they hated Saracens. You know, like there was, uh, you know, whenever we whenever we met up in the England team, Goody, I'm sure you you picked up on this as well. Like people didn't like us, um, and you know there was inevitably there was a feeling that we got what we deserved. Um, and look, like I'm I'm certainly in the boat that you know we we deserved. We got we got things wrong and we had to take our punishment and you know unfortunately that comes with people's opinions um but we need to sort of be humble enough to to take that on board and realize that they're entitled to say what they're saying but yeah i mean when when it comes from people that you're close to i think that's when it that's when it probably hurts the most because it's not just about you know the club itself cheating and and getting relegated like this is genuinely affecting people's lives like you know, as amazing as it is that Alex sat in Japan right now, his plan wasn't to be there a year ago. And actually, you know, his he's had to up and move his life over to Japan. People have had to retire. You look at Brad Barrett, who, you know, you talk about a world 15, a, a team of the decade, he can't be that far away from it. You know, an absolute legend of the club, club captain, all the rest of it. You know, Richard Wigglesworth, things, you know, people like that. I just think, you know, these are the, it actually did genuinely affect people's lives and you know um when it gets like that i think it then becomes more upsetting yeah i think from from my point of view as well i agree with everything jamie said 
I was a bit more annoyed at some of the people who were outspoken. Yeah, they are entitled to their opinion. I just thought it was a bit unnecessary. Another sort of dagger in the in the in the back, really, um, from uh, people who had played with knew pretty well. Um, and in generally, I just thought they were just doing it just to um, be controversial at some point, or just to be really outspoken because of their dislike. And then these people who openly tried to sign for our club and then wanted to be part of it and were always really intrigued by what we did and yet you know when they had the chance they were quick to you know put the knife in and uh i just think you know things go around in, in rugby and you should be careful what you say and uh you know, no one's perfect and as jamie said you know we were all going through t- uh, turmoil at that point so uh it was probably unnecessary so in eight months time or whenever it happens to be when you're all back together or, or people come back from their different countries. Um, do you think it's going to be the same? Do you think you're going to have that sort of same collective atmosphere or will it be more tentative, do you think, Jamie? I, don't, I definitely don't think it'll be tentative. Like the, the boys are already talking about getting the band back together. Um, you know, I'm incredibly excited about it. Um, you know, these, like, you know, it's, it's going to be weird going into the club every day and not having good in there, trying to take the piss out of everybody on the physio bed and, you know, all these guys, we've got some pretty special blokes who who aren't at the club. And, you know, I think that the energy levels are going to be through the roof when those guys come back. Um, yeah, you know, it is, it is when you say, is it going to be the same? I don't think it will be the same. But actually, is that could that potentially be a good thing for the club? Yes. You know, that we've we had an amazing 10 years. You know, we, we achieved some pretty incredible things. And actually, when, you know, you look at all great, teams franchises in america or the rest of it you might go through a slight blip no one stays at the top forever and this might be an opportunity for us to reset and find a new way of us going forward as a group with you know some more experienced players at the top but also some incredibly exciting youngsters and and also have a little look at our culture and, and what we're doing well and also you know what we really need to change so um i, I actually personally think it's it's the most exciting time to be involved at the club and i was one of the lucky ones that was in a position to stay. So uh, I'm hugely excited about being a part of that. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm excited as well to come back and to do this rebuilding process in a sense, because it is a rebuild. You know, we've lost uh, you know some big players. We've lost some senior players who've been part of this journey for so long. But I think um, with all the sort of hatred and things said about the club and people chucking so much at us, I think it would just bring us hopefully close together, you know, and actually give us something to go, right, this is us now to prove a point. And that's exciting um, for me. And it's something that, you know, I can't wait to have us all back together again and to showcase what it, what it is to be a, a Samson's team and, and a group going forward. Now, Alex, you mentioned uh, Brad Barrett and uh, teams of the decade and who you would put in it. Well, World Rugby have come up with their men's and women's players of the decade and teams of the decade. And I'm just keen to get your opinions on them both. Um, let's just run through the men's for you. In the front row, we've got the Beast, Tendai Matawirara, Bismarck Duplessis and Owen Franks. Agree, disagree? Jamie? I agree. Yeah. So the Beast, I'd like, I would put in, you look at longevity in the game, you look at the way that he... You know, he won that World Cup final, um, you know, involved in the one before. I just think, yeah, 100% tick. I think Dane Coles deserves, you know, a nod. I just think with all this, like, there's an interesting thing in that, like, if it's the team of the decade, do they not have to have played for the, de- like, for the decade? I don't know. The majority of the 10 years. Like, yeah, it's yeah, it's an interesting one. There's been a, yeah, it's been, there's, there's a couple of people who, like, retired in, in 2015 and stuff, which... I find interesting, but yeah, all in all, I'd I'd go with that. Um, that front row's that front row's pretty good and be pretty horrible to play against. I mean, I think Dan Cole deserves a mention personally. Dan Cole, that is not Dan Cole's. You know, just England set piece has been dominant for a number of years. He's been he's played what ninety caps for England. Um, at times, he was playing eighty minutes every week. Um, I know it's not a, a sexy pick, but um, you know a very good scrummager from from all accounts. I'm told. Um, yeah, you're a, gu- you're a guru uh, of the scrummy. 
Well, no, he, he, he no, goes it's a good forward. point. It's a good he point. Go, he it's goes a good forward. Point. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just think, it, you know, in terms of someone who's played throughout that sort of 10 years, you know, he's... he's no, 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 100%. He, he, his, his name should definitely country. be in the hat as well. Okay, we've got a Kiwi second row, Brody Retallick and Sam Whitelock. Difficult to, difficult to challenge that, really. Like, could you put Matt Field in there? He was, I suppose, like, Matt Field and both are... Like they they probably earlier stages of the decade really, yeah. like could yeah, you throw so. Marrow in the mix? Like he has been around since twenty fifteen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, difficult to argue that. I'd I'd go with it. Nah, I mean, look, I think I think Whitelock definitely for because he's played like hundred caps yeah. in that period. Um, so I'm happy with that. All right, uh, back row we've got David Pocock, Richie McCaw, Sergio Parisi. Flankers, hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Parise is an interesting Eight. one. Oh, I don't agree with Parise. Um, fundamentally, okay. I don't think he's been the world's best at any period in that 10 years. And I think, not that you just want to keep picking all blacks, but um, you've got, um, his, his name's just left me. Number Kieran, eight, Kieran Reed. Reed. Uh, Kieran yeah, Reed. got Kieron Reed, yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, he's been there for that whole 10-year yeah. period. He's captain his country to uh, 40 or tests. Um, I, I think he, he has to be in there. And, and, if if not him, then Billy Billy. Yeah, probably. Billy. I would also throw Toby Falatau in the mix. Like I just think, mm-hmm. like that guy is just unbelievable. We played against him the other day, and he was by far Wales' his best player, and has been playing for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, I just think he's he's right up there. But yeah, Reed Reed and Billy and and Toby is yeah some serious quality I'm, there. I'm glad Pocock's um, been mentioned as well because he is unbelievable. He he ruins games, and he kept sort of Australia in the fight so many times with his turnovers. Yeah. I played against him at under 20s and he was just the best player I've ever seen. And then to see him go to test level and just just make a mockery of the breakdown, um, you know, he, he's a phenomenal player. So uh, a lot of injuries, but brilliant player. Okay, goody. The halfbacks they've chosen are Connor Murray and Dan Carter. Well, Dan Carter obviously has been killing it in Japan for the last couple of years, so that's a, a reason why he should be uh, in the in the best players of the century, uh, <laughs> let alone the decade. Um, but um, yeah, look, I think you can't argue with Dan Carter too much. Um, I think Sexton Owen probably would be close uh, because they played throughout the decade. But Dan Carter, obviously, winning the World Cup. Um, Pretty impressive there, uh, and a very good looking bloke. So not much I can say against him. Um, I good think looking Connor halfbacks, Mar- those good looking halfbacks. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually there's been a lot of talk about um, playing Aaron Smith as the nine. Uh, I, I think Conor Murray's a phenomenal player. Um, I think if you see what Ireland's done, you know his influence on that Lions in 2017. He was he was incredible, um, and uh, yeah, I think he's a brilliant brilliant player. Um, and Ireland's sort of rise throughout the lot of this 10 years, a lot to do with him and obviously Sexton and other guys, but he has a massive impact. So I quite like that as a pick. Um, uh, but Aaron Smith would probably get a nod as well. In the centres, Jamie, Manonu and Brian O'Driscoll? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like it's difficult not to pick Manu Tuolangi in there, isn't it? Like there are no Englishmen in there, which is bugging me. Yeah, that um, is. That is a bizarre and just one. like man, we should Manu. try being Scottish. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> um, oh, just that I don't know, like Manu, Manu in there, like like O'Driscoll and Nonu are just freaks, aren't they? Like, but Manu is just. Oh. I think it comes down to the criteria, though. Like Brian O'Driscoll is probably the best player ever to play in the Northern Hemisphere, potentially. Um, yeah. But was he not at his best between 2000 and 2010? More so, and I would say. Definitely. Now, if it's just on how good the player is, then you pick him. But if it's over the 10-year period, I think Jonathan Davis has been incredible uh, yeah. winning Grand Slams for Wales, yeah. two Lions tours, which he played all six tests, um, and he got player of the series in 2017, I believe. Um, and he's it, just a, an immense player. We talked about him earlier. Jamie admired his body shape and his muscles, uh, said he looked good naked. Um, and Excellent, you know, yeah. I just think he's he's someone who who probably deserves to be there for this ten years more than a Driscoll, and that's no slight against a Driscoll. He's a phenomenal player, but uh, I would pick Jonathan Davis. Okay, and the wings we've got Brian Habana and George North. Goody. Yeah, I sort of think about this. Um, you know, a lot of the All Black wingers 
they in for a couple of years and out. You know, they've got so much talent from Milner Scudder to Surveyor to Naholo, um, Corey Jane before that. You know, there's, there's so many good wingers they've had. Um, I think Brian Habana um, was still, you know, exceptional, even up to two, even though he retired in 2015. And George North has been very good for Wales. I, I didn't really have anyone else as a winger to, to put forward. I know if Jamie's got any ideas on that. So, uh, you know, a lot of guys who've been made good, but I, I think those two have, have been exceptional. Yeah, I go, I go with that really. Like, I'm struggling to think of, of anyone else who's had the sim, like a similar impact over that period of time. Like, I'm just going to have my English hat on here though. Like, Johnny May's done a pretty good job, hasn't he? Hmm. But like, team of the decade... Hard to say, really. Chris okay, Ashton yeah, keeps I, texting me saying I should no pick him. Chance. But, um, no chance. No way. He, is, he would honestly make <laughs> the team look so attractive because he's the ugliest bloke in the world 15. <laughs> but, um, at the same time, no, you can't pick him. Um, never. He's delusional. Well, he played at 15 at the weekend, didn't he? But the world uh, player of the decade, uh, team 15, is Ben Smith. Can't argue yeah, with that, in my eyes. Yeah, he's yeah. a very, very good player. Uh, exceptional, really. I, yeah. I'm doing just justice there, just service even. Yeah. Uh, he, he's an amazing player. And, and actually, he sort of does it without being freakishly quick or mm. huge or great at anything. He's just a brilliant, brilliant player. He does makes breaks for fun, does all the small things so well um, and probably underrated by the general public. I would say he's a, he's an exceptional player. And the world player of the decade in the men's game was Richie McCall. Would you agree with that? I'd go with that. Yeah, hard hard not to agree with that. Yeah, it's uh, like <laughs> he's the GOAT. Um, let's just run through the women's because that's quite an interesting one. As you would expect, a lot of uh, England players in there, Rocky Clark, Sophie Hemming, Tamara Taylor, Maggie Alfonsi, uh, Katie daly McLean. Emily Scarrett, Lydia Thompson, Nolly Waterman. Interestingly, the women's player of the decade, Jessie Tremoulier from France, wasn't actually included in the list of the team of the decade. Now, we wouldn't <laughs> want to take it away from Nolly Waterman because she is wonderful. But that is a little bit odd that the player of the decade isn't in, isn't in the team of the decade, do you think? Could you a not, good could English you not representation. Have, could you not have shifted like Nolly onto the wing, maybe? Like, I just... It just doesn't. Center, it just doesn't make sense, does it? That's it. It doesn't sit right. It doesn't. But, it doesn't well, make the whole process look great. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but because, a good representation from England. Yeah. From the yeah. England no, process, as you would which, expect. Which, but that you know, it's you know they've been a very dominant side for yeah. a number of those years. They've obviously won the World Cup. Um, you know, it, it's great to see. You know, and they've been a, a sort of leading light in the women's game and. It seems to be they're taking their game up and up each year. So um, great to see and hopefully more success in the future. So guys, some sad news that we learned today is that a group of former players, including Steve Thompson, um, is suing the rugby authorities uh, after saying that he's got early signs of dementia and he is blaming rugby for this. Uh, he cannot remember, he says, any of the matches and he played all of the matches in that 2003 Rugby World Cup win. Um, desperate sad. Uh, how much, Jamie, have protocols changed over the years since you've been playing even? Yeah, obviously, look, first of all, it's it's horrendous news. Um, Steve was someone that I looked up to massively as a kid. Uh, he's also someone who's been very supportive of me during my career, sending me a lot of messages throughout. So, you know, horrible to hear something so horrific happen to, to such a nice bloke. Um, mm -hmm. Look, I think that's, that's the sort of I guess the the encouraging thing uh, is that the protocols are in place now are, are completely different to back in 2003. And, um, you know, you get asked a lot, you know, are you worried about, you know, when you hear about these things like this, are you worried about it? And, you know, I don't think that you can afford to be whilst you're playing, but at the same time, you know, you've got to put a huge amount of faith and trust into the, into the medical staff and, and actually the coaches that look out for it now as well, I think the awareness around concussion is a lot better at the minute. still think there's a way to go, but at the same time, you know, the the medical staff, the protocols that, that go in place when you do get a head knock, make sure that you're absolutely right when you come back into play. So, you know, that gives me a lot more faith. And, um, you know, I think that that's certainly been a massive improvement and it's night and day from what it was in back in 2003. Yeah, and I think... Um... You know, obviously, thoughts go out to Steve and the other players in in this 
um, case. And it's never nice to hear that a fellow rugby player is suffering. And, and obviously, it's, it's terrible news. Um, I, I do think we're always constantly learning more and more about concussion and what goes on in the head and the impact of the sport. Um, but I, I do think the welfare has improved massively since I started in rugby. Uh, as Jamie said, not only are the medical practitioners more aware of it, but the coaches are more aware of it. Players are, are more aware of it. So um, there's a, an understanding that, you know, we do need to take care of our heads and, you know, concussion is a very serious issue for, for later life. There used to be a thing that a player would try and almost evade an HIA. Do you think that that has changed, Alex, over the years? Do you think that players are a bit more savvy that they're not going to try and get out of this? Yeah, I think there was um, probably just your own pressure you put on yourself. You didn't want to let the team down. You didn't want to be pulled out for a head knock. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to sort of sort of measure it. You know, it's not like a broken leg or something. People can't see it. So it's just how you feel. feel. And you just go, I'll, I'll be all right. I'll shake it off and I'll, I'll go onto the field. But um, I, I think, you know, more and more people are aware that, you know, they want to be able to be able to be a, a parent to the kids and be a, a good husband or whatever it is at home for later life and, do, and actually be able to work in an office or do a job. Uh, and they're not, and they're thinking actually, maybe I should just be careful of this. You know, I can have one game off in the premiership season and come back a week later and be in a better place. So I, I think there's a, there's a bigger awareness from the players as well. You never want to let a team down, but people are a bit more careful now, which is only a good thing. Uh, gents, I think we're running out of time. It has been a pleasure. Jamie, I know you've got to go and uh, plan for your wedding. Is that what this week entails? Yeah, yeah, I'll do <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you need yeah. to get the old paracetamol in and uh, Bar Barocca by the sounds of it. What's that, mate? I'm oh, fine, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Alex. Um, Alex, what does your day entail, dare we ask? Probably go out to bed for a little bit, to be honest. Uh, I've actually got a day off, so probably be hitting the uh, the yakiniku, the all-you-can-eat meat at some stage. Um, it's just, uh, you'll be getting, you'll be getting an onsen, won't you? Uh, possibly, yeah. How uh, oh, good. I, I, I do Not like again. the onsen. Yeah, How good. It's, it's, it's very weird at the start, obviously. I've, I discussed it last time, but being naked in a sauna, mate. watching sumo wrestling with a load of men um, is an odd one. But once oh, you embrace the it. culture, it's incredible. Um, how, good are the, good, like, good how good are the stools in the shower as well? I know we've covered this, but like, how good are the stools? Like Sitting down in the shower is just revolutionary. Love it. I'm 100% bringing the stool back to me. It's yeah, such a can nice you bring me one, actually? Can you bring me one there. back? Yeah, I'll get you one back. Yeah, I'll Cheers, get you one mate, with thanks. NEC branding on it. So you yeah, can get I've that. actually tried well, is to. It, is it special? Can't you just buy a stool? No, you can't. Mm. I tried to find one oh. online, and you can't. Okay. It's not the same. They're like baby stools, really. Yeah, but they are. They're yeah. not quite baby stools, but they support 150 um, kilo. Yeah, and they've got a nice lip to them, so they really do fit in nicely. And you just sit there and just to sit, sit down, and it makes the shower experience phenomenal. I must say, it's uh, has changed my life. I spend a lot longer in the shower now because of it. And I'm not attracted. Wow, we're lucky to have uh, we, we're lucky to have had you on the pod before you dashed <laughs> off. Um, thank you so much for your Big time, day. guys. <laughs> thank you to you for watching or listening, and for choosing House of Rugby. Bye bye. You've been watching the House of Rugby season three on Joe.